Hey there, my name is Mike Parejo. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at RVCC. I oversee student ministries at the Parkland campus. I'm also one of our teaching pastors. And in a moment, I want to show you a commercial that was released all the way back in the mid-1970s. Yes, almost 50 years ago, uh, and it's even going to be in colors. Just, just amazing. Uh, but it's a commercial that was made probably before a lot of you watching were even born. Now, fair warning, what you are about to see... Uh, your eyes are going to be subjected to really poor video quality because, again, this is a commercial made 50 years ago, and you are going to be uh, invaded by really poor fashion sense as well. So, so just be prepared for that. It, it's a commercial for the fast food company Burger King, and the message that they were marketing back in the mid-1970s is one that has invaded our society today in every way, shape, and form. So go ahead and check this out. Two Whoppers, two Whopper Juniors, and four Coca-Cola. And would I have to wait long if you made one Whopper with no pickle and no lettuce? No, sir. Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us serve it your way. Oh, well, in that case, could I have the other Whopper with extra ketchup? Sure. We can serve your grilled beef Whopper fresh with everything on top of any way you think. Now that's the way to do things, our way. Have it your way, have it your way at Burger King, at Burger King. Yes, back in the 1970s, Americans were given the freedom to ask cashiers wearing weird hot air balloon hats. That they, they were given the freedom to ask for no pickles on their burgers. Can I do that? I, I can do that. Or you could ask for extra ketchup on your hamburger. And today, 50 years later, we have become uh, a people who want absolutely everything customized. We want everything our way. We no longer ask permission for food to be made our way. We, we order it exactly the way that we want it. And it's not just in, in the food industry as well, that, you know, just about everywhere, we can have things our way. If, if you want to buy a brand new car, you can go online and you can have your car or truck or minivan or whatever, you can have it custom made with as many bells and whistles as you want if you have the time and the money to wait for it to be made. The same thing can be done for a home. You can have a custom house made exactly the way that you want it if you've got the time and the money to do so. And there are plenty of companies out there like Amazon and Netflix and, and so many others that they, they pay attention to the products that we consume and then they will offer us similar products based on our preferences. They, they keep track and then they'll offer us other things saying like, you like this, you might like that. They want us to have it our way. We live in a world where we get to have it our way. Unfortunately, this Burger King mentality uh, we take it when we enter into the church doors. You know, the, the phrase church shopping is, is frequently uh, a, a term that we use when, when we're looking for a new church. And when we go church shopping, we want it our way. And so we can look for churches that are going to provide top-notch sermon content that's going to meet me exactly where I am spiritually. Like, it, it's, like, it's like somehow the pastor had a camera in my house and knew what I wanted to hear this week. Or... I want, I want a band experience. I want a worship experience that, that feels really good to me. I want it to have the kind of songs that I really like. I want it to be at the volume level that's really good for me. I, I want the kinds of instruments that are used. I, I want the whole thing to help me connect effortlessly with God on a Sunday morning. You know, I, I, I want a church that has kids and students programming that makes my kids beg to come back, that they love it so much. I want that. I want a group, uh, I, want, I want a church that has small groups that meet on the days and the times that are convenient for me and my family, and, and those groups have people in them that are a great match for exactly where I'm at in life. That, that's what I need. You know, and, and alternately, one of the other habit-your-way approaches to church is, is the mentality that, well, attending church is, is an option, but it's not 
it's not necessary to attend church. I'll, I'll go when kind of the mood strikes me like, you know, I, I can worship just as easily from, from a church building as I can on the top of Mount Rainier. I, I can worship anywhere. I, here's the problem with the have your way, have it your way mentality. It's never been God's design for his church and it never will be. If you have a Bible, I'd like you to find your way over to Ephesians chapter 4, whether you've got a physical Bible or whether you've got the, uh, the YouVersion Bible app on your phone or your, or your uh, you know, device, you can open it up. Ephesians 4 was written by a man named Paul, and, and Paul had established many churches. One of them was in this city known as Ephesus, and Ephesus was the religious center uh, of the province of Asia, and within this, this city of Ephesus was the, the temple to the this, this false goddess Air, uh, Artemis. And, and this temple of Artemis drew all sorts of tourists and worshipers. And, and this temple also served as a giant bank from which cities and nations and even individuals would come and apply for loans. And so for, for the local you know, body of Christ, the, the, the Christian church uh, in Ephesus, they would look at this great temple and maybe they would get some, some different ideas in terms of what church should be like. And you could go to church and, and kind of get it however you wanted. And, and so Paul writes this letter to the followers of Christ in Ephesus to remind them that that's not what church is supposed to look like. It wasn't supposed to look like this big institutionalized religion that they saw in their city. Paul uses a different word for the church. He, he refers to the church as a body a body in which all the different parts have to rely on each other so that the whole church, the whole body functions well. And so in today's passage that we're going to be looking at in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul reminds us of where we all need to keep our focus. And so I'm going to read, starting off with Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, Paul's not being metaphorical when he writes, you know, as a prisoner for the Lord. He, he was actually under house arrest when he wrote this letter. And, and so despite the fact that he cannot spend his time visiting these various churches that, that he has helped to establish, he could write these letters to remind them of the life that they were called to lead with one another as part of this greater body. And so again, to, looking back at verses 2 and 3, he says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Okay, the, the, these are not little suggestions like, hey, you know, if, if you have time to remember, like, try, try to be humble. I, that's, that's kind of a good idea. Or, you know what, I understand that it's hard to be patient, especially with people like Tiberius. I mean, just, just try not to let him get on your nerves, okay? Like, he's, he's calling us to something greater. The, the idea of working towards a unified body is hard because our national inclination is to want it our way. And so we have to actively fight this consumer mentality so that we can make every effort to be unified. Why else would Paul reiterate this word one seven different times in verses four through six? Let's look at that again. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Look at all the things that we have, that we've got there to be unified about. But we risk that unity when we, when we put our own preferences first, or we assume that what I need must be best for everyone. And, and, and while it's silly to think that way, we totally do that. We assume that like, well, what's best for me spiritually has got to be what's best for everybody else spiritually. You know, it's interesting, the majority of the time that churches receive complaints, and yes, they do receive complaints, the majority of those complaints are about preferences. You know, uh, you know the, the, the message didn't go deep enough today, or I, I didn't learn anything new, or there were too many songs, or there weren't enough songs, or we need more hymns, or we need to learn more new songs, or... 
And we've all got those complaints living in our minds, and we don't all voice those complaints, but those kinds of things, it's very easy for them to go through our minds because we all have preferences. And so we would be wise to remember this command to make every effort to be unified because it helps to remind us that we are all responsible for the health of the entire body. And ultimately, like the only, the only person who knows what's best for everyone, it's not me, it's Jesus, okay, which Paul addresses as we jump ahead a few verses. I'm going to jump ahead to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So, so initially, in, in this passage of the letter, Paul lists off some of the various ways that, that Jesus has empowered some people within the church body to serve the greater body with, with specific spiritual gifts. And there's not really a need to break down all the differences between, well, what's an apostle and what's a prophet? How does that compare to an evangelist or a pastor or teacher? That, that's not really the focus of where we need to go right now. But the purpose of all these gifts we see is one and the same, looking back at verses 12 and 13. All these gifts, it's so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. And so what we see here, there are these two concepts, unity and maturity, and these two ideas are linked hand in hand. You know, we gather together as a church. When we gather on Sunday mornings, when we gather together, it's for the purpose of growing together. And ultimately, together, we want to reflect the head of the body, the head of the body being Jesus. And so this means that not only do each one of us personally need to seek maturity and, and, and taking steps to grow in our faith, but we also need to help other people grow and mature in their faith. I mean, honestly, what good does it do if, if only some parts of the body are growing and maturing? Okay, like kids, don't skip leg day. Don't, don't do it. It's, it's not pretty. I mean, Jesus wants the entire body to be mature, not just parts of it. And so for, for the rest of our time here, I want to address two questions when, when it comes to gathering together as a body on Sundays. Okay, now being part of the body of Christ, there's a lot of different pieces of that, but I want to address specifically when we gather together. And those two questions are this. Number one, what can I do to become more mature in my faith? And then the question that we have to ask alongside that first question is this, what can I do to help others become more mature in their faith? If we are going to be completely committed, if we're going to make every effort to be unified, we have to answer both of those questions. And I'm going to do my very best to speak the truth in love. That's, that, that's what I've been called to do as, as a pastor is to speak this truth in love so that we can all take steps of maturity. And so I want to give us some really practical advice when it comes to your own personal growth on Sunday. And then after that, I want to address how do we help others grow. And so, so if you want to grow and if you want to mature in your faith on Sunday mornings as we gather together, number one, I'm going to ask you to attend regularly. Okay. This is not a command to be in church 52 Sundays a year or you're a dirty sinner. Okay. That, that's, that's not where I'm going with this. But church also cannot be viewed as just an option for Sunday morning. It, it's not an optional thing. And I understand sometimes we have to work on Sundays or vacations happen or people get sick. I mean, li life happens. I, I, I get it. But gathering together as a body of Christ needs to be a priority. 
we have to come together on a regular basis. And so we need to attend regularly. And that leads us into the second piece. If you want to grow, don't just attend regularly, but prepare yourself regularly. Well, prepare myself for what? Prepare yourself to engage on Sunday mornings. When you're in a church service, we need to come prepared to engage our hearts, to engage our soul, and to engage our minds in the worship of God. Now, what I'm about to say may be one of the least popular things I've ever said, and yet I think it's even ridiculous that I have to preface it that way, but this means that you need to get a good night's sleep on Saturday, which seems really silly depending on uh, who you are. Like, well, wait, what? Like, no, like Saturday is when I go out and do certain things. I get it. But if you come to church and you are tired and you are yawning and or sleeping your way through service— you're not engaging. You're not going to be able to receive what God has for you, and you're certainly not going to be able to help others. And so make sure you get a good night's sleep. This is also not going to be very popular. I would say make it your goal to be at church 10 to 15 minutes early. Don't make it your goal to be on time. Make it your goal to to arrive to church early. Avoid the stress of rushing to get to church so that when you arrive, you have actually time. If you've got kids, you can put them in kids ministry. You can do all those things. And then you yourself can actually prepare your heart to worship. When we are rushing and we're stressed, and, and we're trying to like, make it in, okay, like, now I got to find seats, and, and oh no, we're already two songs in, what do I do? Like, our souls are not going to be in a place that are really ready to worship at all. We're not going to be ready to engage. So, so do whatever it takes to arrive early so that your soul can be prepared for worship. Third thing I'm going to ask you regularly is, is, is to then actually engage in the service itself. Once the service starts, be present for it. You know, participate in, in, in the worship songs. Now, I understand that singing is not for everybody. I totally get it. And so participate in the worship at the very least in your mind. Like take in the words that are popping up on the screen and, and what does that mean? And even if, I, if I'm not singing it with my voice, at least in my mind, in my soul, I want to be engaging with God and considering what we are focusing on together as, as a body. Bring your Bible Bring your Bible to church. If you don't have a Bible, you can take one of the ones that we have. You can buy one really cheap or just get the free one on the YouVersion app. But have a Bible. <laughs> to be honest, I've, I've struggled with this for years and years and years in church and that we always put the Bible verses up on the screen. And sometimes I wonder, are we doing people a disservice by putting the Bible verses on the screen and not forcing people to actually open up a Bible and to read it? I don't know, that's something that I continue to struggle with, but, but I'd encourage you, if you really want to engage in the service, be in God's Word. Have a pen, have a pencil, take notes. If you're using the YouVersion Bible app, you can, you can highlight and underline, you can, you can type in notes as you're going. Write down questions. And so when it comes to in, in engaging in this service, as we listen to the Word of God that's being preached, Remember the purpose of it again, as we go back to Ephesians chapter 12, like the people who are tasked to teaching God's word, they do it in order to equip his people for works of service. God's people, the purpose of being equipped for works of service is for the good of the entire body. We can't separate our personal growth from the overall maturity of the body. Growing in biblical literacy and knowledge is a really good thing, but only, only if it is used for the greater purpose of taking action and serving others. See, this is very different than the have it your way mentality that we can get used to, where we can easily dismiss a sermon because our minds weren't just blown by the depth of teaching. I can tell you right now, if you come here on a regular basis, and again, I would encourage you, attend regularly, but there are going to be weeks where you feel that the message didn't speak to you. Now, those of us on the teaching team, we do our very best to put together sermons that are engaging, but there are going to be weeks where the content doesn't connect with you as well as maybe it connects with other people. That's okay. But the idea of becoming mature in the faith means that on those weeks when maybe the, the, the teaching doesn't really connect with me, I also don't give them the temptation to complain or tear down or compare teaching here to which 
to what I could get someplace else. You know, when I was in college, there was a weekend where some, some friends and I, we, we were going to be out of town. And, you know, even though we were going to be out of town for the weekend, we still wanted to go to a church. Okay. And, and the guys that I went with, they had all been Christ followers a lot longer than me. Like I, I, I gave my life to Jesus when I was a freshman in college. And so for me, like I felt like I was still kind of a baby Christian and I was learning. And so we're out of town and we decided, okay, we're going we're gonna to go to this church. And it was certainly a different flavor of church than what we were used to. Um, but, but we were there and, and, you know, and, you know, we engaged in the worship and, and I was listening to the message and I actually learned quite a bit. Like, again, I was still relatively young in my faith, but, but there was a lot of things that I took away and I was like, okay, that, that was a good sermon. I, I liked that a lot. But as we were driving away, we started having a conversation in the car and, and one of my friends who was in the front seat and I was in the back, he had gone to church most of his life and he said, you know what, that sermon, like, it's kind of trash. Like, I already knew all that stuff. I mean, he was clearly unimpressed and he was probably bored through the entire message. And suddenly I felt very stupid. I felt really dumb for not knowing that it wasn't a good sermon. And my friend had no idea that while he was complaining about what he considered a lack of depth in the sermon, he didn't realize that he was actually tearing me down at the same time. Which brings us back to the second question that we have to consider when we gather together. What can I do to help others become more mature in their faith? What are some practical ways that we can be others-minded when we gather together for church? First way I think that we can be others-minded is that we need to remember to seek out others when we are at church. Now let's face it, we're all creatures of habit. Okay, we all are. Chances are you sit in the same seats almost every single week. Okay, I, I can hear you laughing even at Graham right now. Like we, we sit in the same seats almost all the time. So does everybody else. Okay, which makes it really hard to meet somebody new unless they happen to come and sit by you that morning or even worse, they take your seat. Okay, like, but it's hard to meet new people if you always sit in the same place. And so I'm not saying every week find a new place to sit. But what if once or twice a month? What if once or twice a month, again, if you are attending regularly, that should be easy enough to do. What if once or twice a month you deliberately sat in a different part next to somebody that you normally wouldn't hang out with? That you deliberately chose to sit by somebody new and introduce yourself to them or even take to the next level. What if you sought out others and invited somebody new to come to church with you? Maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a family member, it could be a coworker, could be, uh, you know, if you get kids at, at, you know, kids in school, may, maybe it's, you know, one of their friends and you want to invite them so, to go to kids' church or whatever and their parents can sit with you. Whatever is, what if you invited somebody new? Let's be deliberate and let's seek out others. If we want to see others grow, we have to seek them out. Number two, we then have to value others. We have to value the people that we're worshiping with. Take the time after service to stay, to hang out, to go deliberately talk to somebody else. I can't tell you how many weeks that we just watch people like the service is over, amen, and people fly out the doors to get to their cars, to get to the rest of their weekend. And I understand certain weeks like, but I had plans set, whatever, I, I get it. But for the most part, what if we spent time after church engaging with other people. Now, I'm not saying that you have to spend 30 minutes every single Sunday in the lobby talking with every person that you see. As an introvert myself, I know how incredibly draining that is, so I get it. But what if you spent just a couple minutes, five minutes after service with one person or, or one small group of people, and you ask them this question, what's something you took away from today's service? What's something that you got out of today? Even asking something as simple as that can make a huge difference in somebody else's growth and somebody else's maturity, knowing that somebody else cares about what they're taking away. I mean, I, I can tell you, if my friend in college, if he had asked me that question, hey, Mike, what's something that you took away from the service instead of just complaining about the lack of depth of the message? I think it would have made a massive difference for both of us. I mean, I would have had the opportunity to share how God had kind of you know, revealed some new things to me. And I think my sharing would have been an encouragement to my friend. And so I want you to think about this. Maybe the way that God speaks to you 
on those mornings where it feels like I didn't, I didn't hear anything new. Maybe the way that he's going to speak to you isn't through the person preaching, but maybe the way that God speaks to you is through how somebody else has processed that message. Maybe that's how God wants to reach out to you. Maybe what you need to hear that particular day is how the light bulb came on for somebody else. It's weird because like we can get grumpy or you know really negative if we feel like we didn't learn anything new or like it was just kind of a basic message. We don't get grumpy on days when people get baptized, right? No, I mean when somebody gets baptized, we clap, we cheer, we cry out of happiness for what God is doing in the life of that other person. Why not take that same mentality? Why not take joy listening to how other people heard from God on a particular morning, even on a morning where I'm not the one who, quote unquote, received anything great. What if I sought out how other people were growing and maturing and allowed that to feed my soul? So ask somebody else after the service, ask them what they heard. Ask what God said to them. Value what God is doing in their heart. And I think you'll be amazed at how that affects you as well. So I want you to seek out others. I want you to value others. Third thing, maybe the most important thing that we can be doing, serve others. When we gather together as a body, we are called to serve each other. Again, part of my role as a pastor is to equip the body for works of service so that the body of Christ will be built up, which means that we all need to be serving. And so right now I'm I'm talking to well over half the room. Uh, You need to start serving. You need to find a way that you can use your gifts to benefit the overall body of Christ. Now, I want you to understand, if you are new to RVCC, if this is, you know, your first month here and and you're still kind of making the decision, is this going to be my church or not? Like, yeah, the expectation isn't that you jump in today and, and start, you know, Start serving away. Okay, that, that, that's not it. But you also have to understand that if this is going to become your church, the expectation is that you get plugged in and you serve, that you are an active member of the body. And if you are already regularly serving at the church, I'm not necessarily talking to you right now. I'm not asking you to take on more. You know, the vast majority of churches find about 20% of the body doing about 80% of the serving which means that that 20% is getting tired and taking on more is not the answer. Again, don't skip leg day, kids. Um, you know, we, we want to see each and every person involved and serving at RVCC. Again, so that the entire body would be built up. And if I'm honest, serving others is maybe the best way that you yourself can grow. Okay, and, and I've seen this time and time again, especially like, you know, in student ministries, as people like, are, are preparing, you know, like my, my leaders, like my volunteers are, are preparing to lead the small group. You know, as you are preparing to go through those questions to lead a group of students through it, like the person preparing to, to, to lead that group learns way more than any of the students do in the group. And that's not a knock on the students. That's just, you know, as you serve, you naturally grow. That, that's the way that it works. Serving others is one of the best ways that we can become mature ourselves. And if I can be blunt with you all, we will never see unity and maturity in the body of Christ if we're not all finding a place to serve and use our gifts for the overall good of the church. If we want unity, if we want to see the maturity of the body, we all have to do our part. Scripture is very clear. We are meant for works of service to build up the body. Everybody has a part. The question is, what's yours? What has God called you to do? Whether you realize it or not, that the local body of Christ at RVCC needs you to act if we are going to experience this unity that we've been called to. We need to give ourselves to one another if we want any chance of experiencing that that beautiful harmony of unity and maturity that Paul is describing in Ephesians 4. This is a body that's designed to work together. It's designed to fit together perfectly, but only if we're all serving. And again, I'm going to try my best to speak the truth in love. A lot of us need to stop viewing the church like Burger King, where we can have it our way. And we need to start viewing the church as a body where we are called to do our part so that the entire body grows. Are you giving yourself to God's church 
helping to bring it life, to bring that unity as we work towards maturity. And there's a lot of ways that you can get plugged in and serve. You know, as, as, you, as you head out today, there is that serve wall outside that you can go and take a look at all the different ways that you can serve. In a couple of weeks, we are going to have Difference Maker Sundays where you can talk to people and, and, and get more plugged in. But what I'm going to ask you to do right now, I'm not saying that like in this very moment, you have to know how you're going to serve. That's crazy. But what I'm going to ask you to do is start praying about it. Start talking to God and asking God, God, how have you designed me? What are the gifts that you've given me? What are the passions you've given me? How can I use those passions? How can I use those gifts? How can I use my talents to be of benefit to the body? The ways that God has gifted you are of service to others. Don't discount the way that God made you. You are beautifully and wonderfully made, and it's not just for the benefit of you. It's for the benefit of others. And so I want to encourage you to find a way and start praying about how you can get plugged in. Because every part matters, whether you're smiling and welcoming people at the front doors or you're out in the parking lot, whether you're preparing communion, whether you're using your your technical skills, you're making coffee, you're serving kids, you're hanging out with middle schoolers or high schoolers, you're leading a community group, you're playing music. Whatever it is, leading, leading a community group, serving online in digital ministry, all these ways, there are so many ways to contribute to the body. But we all need to be doing our part if we want to see this beautiful unity that's described. If we want to see the entire body maturing and reflecting the head that is Jesus. Friends, you have been equipped for works of service. It's time to make a difference in the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you as our creator, as our designer, and the design that you have made for your church. As we gather together, God, God, we want to first come to to engage so that we are truly worshiping you, God, but, but part of our worship is how we treat one another, how we serve one another, how we love one another. And so, God, I pray that you would be working in each and every one of our hearts helping us to see how we can be serving. And God, even if we are serving, God, help put somebody on our hearts that we can ask to come alongside us and join us in that serving, God. We can all do more in helping this body grow, helping this body become more mature so that we can truly reflect you well in our world so that more and more people would want to be part of your church. God, we thank you for this time that we pray that it has brought glory to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.